This small child, this tiny, fragile life, carries with it the hope of all humanity. This small voice, now crying out in dark chambers, will one day still the raging sea, will call forth the dead to rise and live. This voice will declare it is finished and shatter the grip of sin. These small hands, now grasping for comfort, will one day restore sight to the blind, will break bread and feed the multitudes. These hands will feel the piercing cold of an iron spike and bring salvation through surrender. These small feet, now wrapped in cloth, will one day travel countless miles upon dusty roads, will stand firm upon rushing water. These feet will crush the snake's head and step forth from an empty tomb, victorious. This small child, this wondrous, perfect gift, is Jesus, our Savior, the promise of eternity. When you're walking through the Bible, um, like we're walking through the Bible, you don't have the luxury of skipping difficult verses or things that you really need to dig out and search out. And I just want to tell you, it's a whole lot easier to do it the other way, to, to find the things that, that you like and ask the Lord to lead you to things that you're familiar with. But um, I don't know if y'all have or not, but I've really, I've really grown in this uh, series that we're in, Walking Through Hebrews. And we're only in chapter 3, but God's really been sharing some good stuff with us, and some of it's been challenging. We got another warning today. Um, you know, churches these days, we'd like to skip the warnings, but the warnings are in there. And so we're going to deal with it today as we read it. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Hebrews 3. And we're going to be in verses uh, 7 through 19 this morning. And uh, just like every time, don't know if we're going to preach or teach or preach, teach or teach, preach or whatever. We're just going to go into it and let God uh, show us what he wants to show us in this passage. And I put a title on it that simply says today, say today, today. if you will hear his voice. Today, if you will hear his voice. So let's read our scripture today. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... And by the way, let me stop right there. This is not in my notes, but this is important. So what the writer of Hebrews is about to do is quote Psalm 95. You can go back and read Psalm 95 later on today. He's about to quote it. But notice what he says before he quotes it. Who does he say says it? The Holy Spirit. Who loves to hear the Holy Spirit speak? Us Pentecostals know how to say amen to that, don't we? What we fail to realize sometimes is when I start reading, Holy Spirit is speaking. That's what the writer of Hebrews just told you. He says, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works. Forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. 
lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. What an incredible time of worship. I pray that we bless you through our worship because that is the aim. It's not our blessing or our benefit. It is for you. And so we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you that as we worshiped, you gave us your presence. You, you made us feel really good during it. And it was, it was great. Your presence was amazing. Now I pray that you would lead us in your word today. These are challenging words. Pray that you help us. I'm simple, Lord. So help me simply explain what you're saying in these passages. Because this is your Holy Spirit that is saying this. So we want to receive it that way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start off by saying this. Sin will deceive and harden your heart. Sin will deceive you and harden your heart. In verse 12 and 13, it said this, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called a day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So sin is deceitful. And you know the very definition of deceit is defined that you don't know it when you're being it. When you're being deceived, you don't know you're being deceived. That's really the problem with deceit. And sin is very deceitful. And can anybody guess why, this, why sin is deceitful? Well, it's because of where it came from. In Genesis 3.13, Eve said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. In 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, Paul says, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the, from the simplicity, simplicity, easy for me to say, the simplicity that is in Christ. Revelation 12, 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mark 4, Jesus, when he's talking about the parable of the seed, he says in verse 18, Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So sin is deceitful. And it continually tries to deceive us through really three primary vehicles. The world, our flesh, and the devil. Matthew Henry said this about sin. He said, sin is deceitful because it appears fair, but it's filthy. It appears pleasant, but it's pernicious. It promises much, but performs nothing. Adrian Rogers once said, There are very few things that are more deceitful, more deceiving 
than sin in the life of a Christian. I want to show you three ways that sin deceives us. First, sin deceives us by promising what it can never deliver. Sin says, go ahead. It'll be fun. Go ahead. You'll enjoy it. You'll feel better. You'll be more fulfilled. Life will be better. Go ahead and take it. Go ahead and tell the lie. Refuse to forgive. Go ahead and say it. Go ahead and jump in bed with that person. Go ahead and look at that website. Go ahead. You need this. It'll bring you happiness. What is it that the serpent said to Eve? The serpent said to Eve, eat this fruit and you shall be like God. Sin deceives us by promising us what it can never deliver to us. Can I get an amen? Amen. You got quiet there for a minute. Secondly, sin deceives us by convincing us that what happens to others will never happen to us. Has sin ever deceived anybody that way? Sin says, wait a minute. You're going to be different. You're going to get away with it. You're going to be able to handle it. You're going to be able to control it. You'll be okay. The serpent said to Eve, you shall not die. You won't die. Third, sin deceives us by creating in us a desire for that which we know can only hurt us. I don't know about y'all, but this is hitting. Sin deceives us by giving us an appetite for something that we know is going to hurt us. We know it's going to harm us. We know it's not going to be better. The little voice says, go ahead. And we stupidly go ahead even though we know we're going to suffer for it. Eve looked at the fruit. She saw that it was good to look at, good to touch, good to taste. And so she took it and she ate it. And we've been taking it and we've been eating it ever since. And we're no different. Even though we know that every time we do it, it's going to hurt us. That is the deceitfulness of sin. Is everybody following me here? That there is a deceitfulness to sin. That there is. And what it does is it leads to a hard heart. And all that means is a hard heart. All it means is that spiritually... We become insensitive. We become insensitive. It's when Christ stops becoming real to you. And you stop looking to Him for your life. And when you stop looking to Christ, unbelief can set in. And when unbelief sets in, you can really become susceptible to the deceitfulness that is sin. And you know you're insensitive to it. When it's not as painful as it used to be. And it's hard. It is hard to be in a genuine close relationship with our Lord. When it really doesn't. When it's not. It's not. It's it's painful to us. When we still do and say things or fail to do things that we know he's calling us to do. And it's painful. And the answer is not to simply ignore it. That's what some theology would say. Well, you just got to ignore it. It's just sin. We don't focus on it. Nobody's saying focus on it. But here's the thing. We love the Lord. He calls us friend. He has saved us. And if I've said things I shouldn't have said, or if I'm holding bitterness in my heart, and I've I've got unforgiveness in me, or I'm doing things that He's led me not to do, told me not to do, spoke into my heart and my spirit not to do, it does still hurt. But you know what happens when I bring my heart to Him? He takes it. 
I've never heard him say, I told you so. I've never heard him say, this is your last chance. I've never heard him say, I've had it up to here with you. I've went to him before and said, Lord, I've had it up to here with them. And how'd y'all know I was talking about y'all? But I hear him say, well, I hadn't had it up to here with you yet. So it is our relationship with the Lord that when our temper gets out of whack or we're doubting God and we shouldn't be or we're gossiping, we're saying, we're, we're dividing, we're just not handling things the way God, we're not walking like we're seated in heavenly places. We're walking like more of the way we used to. That it does hurt our heart. That is actually proof that the Holy Spirit's living within us and and God loved us just the way we were, but He loves us so much He doesn't want us to stay that way. So He's disciplining us and helping us and comforting us and encouraging us and showing us the right way. That He's continually forgiving and cleansing us. And what He did on Calvary is enough for all of my mistakes and failures for the rest of my life. But the problem with the deceitfulness of sin is it gets you to the place where nothing really matters anymore. And you never, those of you that are walking the steps of recovery, just forget about the moral inventory. Just forget about the people you've hurt. Just forget about all the character defects in your life. Let's focus on everybody else's. <laughs> let's forget, in Jesus' terms, let's forget about this big old two by four in our eye. And let's try to get that little splinter that somebody else has. That is the issue with the deceitfulness of sin. That what it will do is it will build layer upon layer upon layer on our heart. Or how about here? Our heart. Mine's not right there. It's right here. Thought I was dead for a minute. Wait a minute. Our heart. It builds up layer after layer after layer after layer. Until it's calloused. You ever had... Blisters, I know uh, Oakley and Haley's probably got the calluses on your skin from playing the bass and the guitar, Randy with those drumsticks. And At first, the skin's really tender and it hurts and it's painful, but then over time, it builds up thickness and thickness and thickness to where you even forget that it ever really hurt that much. And that's the problem with the deceitfulness of sin is that we don't even realize that we're just stubbornly and rebelliously walking contrary to the life God has called us to. And the writer of Hebrews is warning us of that. But there is a cure. <laughs> now Jesus is ultimately the cure. Because the blood of Jesus, His grace is greater than our sin. Where sin abounds, His grace is greater than. But there's a cure for us walking through life with our heart becoming hard and the deceitfulness of sin taking us out of our calling. And the cure is encouragement. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 13. He says exhort. And exhort is just King James' way of saying encourage. Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So that word that means encourage, we are commanded to encourage each other daily. The cure for the deceitfulness of sin and the hard heart that we can develop is encouragement. The writer of Hebrews would say again in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. 
Romans 1 and verse 11 and 12. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. And so the writer of Hebrews says, instead of getting involved in the deceitfulness of sin and the hard heart that comes with it, encourage each other daily. You ever been down and out? Everything in your flesh feels like giving up. But then somebody encourages you. And all of a sudden your perspective changes. At least mine does. And you're ready to keep on fighting. Has that happened for you? That happens. Roger, I just want to say you are incredible. I mean, you always seem to be joyful. I love that you kid. That's what I love to do, too. It makes us smile. It makes us laugh. But you've got a heart that it is for God and for God's people. You love the children, and you have a special gift for them. And, just God, you, and, you, and you let the Lord speak through you, right, to go and encourage people. And I just want to tell you that is admirable. Now, Roger's not going to tell you this right now, but he's thinking, you know what? That felt pretty good. <laughs> right? It does. It does. It just simply does. Encouragement does something. It does something. I think every time we encourage someone, it takes one of those layers that they have on their heart and it peels it back. And so they may, not be, they may not be completely healed by one word of encouragement. But I want to tell you something. If we're encouraging each other daily, it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference. I got three Jeffs that try to come and pray for me or, or help me ask for advice or, or want to know how to work the service out. And you guys encourage me. I've been hiding from this one for a few weeks. <laughs> Somebody's got to play the keyboard, so that's you know, just the way it is. <clears throat> but, is there like bunches of keyboard players in here? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. The kitchen, man, those of you that work in the kitchen, I didn't, get, I didn't have a chance to get any today. But I like to walk back there and get me a piece of sausage and some sweet tea. It's good stuff. Those of you that, that, that call, you know, to, to, to check on me or text me, encourages me, that's pretty cool. It's amazing. I can just speak firsthand that encouragement goes miles and miles and miles. Am I right? Has anybody ever been encouraged and thought, man, I hated that? Secretly, you guys are in the seat going, maybe you say something about me today. <laughs> we don't have time to say something about everybody. But you're all important to me. And when I'm not here, I miss you. I miss all of you. Because you're, 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 you are who God has put into my life during this time. And I'm appreciative of that. And I just want to encourage you. If you're encouraged, it helps. It just does. Do you know, as I was saying what I was saying, I thought I heard a little whisper. And I don't think it was from anybody in the room, but it was a familiar whisper. It was a, it was a whisper that the enemy likes to whisper. And maybe y'all didn't hear it, but I, it's like I heard the devil whisper into somebody's ear. Well, that's well and good, but nobody encourages you. You ever felt like that? Nobody encourages you? You ain't got to say amen. I know you do. But can I give you a little secret about encouragement? Encouragement is like double-sided tape. It works on both sides. 
It works on both sides. <laughs> Encouragement is another way of giving. It's what it is. It's giving. Notice, I want you to notice, if we went back to that verse, it did not say this. This is not what it said. It didn't say, make sure you get encouraged daily. What did it say? It said, encourage one another daily. In other words, it isn't one-sided. You can't do anything about the other side. But you're the only one that can do anything about your side. <laughs> Encouragement is the cure for a hard heart, whether it is given or received. So maybe you find your place, yourself in a place of isolation today. You've been hanging out there for a while for whatever reason, and your heart has become hard through the deceitfulness of sin. And the devil's made his plan to make sure that nobody encourages you. And even when people attempt to, he makes sure that you don't really receive it. And if you find yourself in a place like that, and we've all been in a place like that, what in the world should you do? You should encourage somebody. And then you should encourage somebody else. And then you should encourage somebody else. Because I'm telling you, it's double-sided. That every time you encourage somebody, it does something for your heart. It just does. I felt better about what I said about Roger probably than he felt better about it. It just takes a layer of the shell that tries to develop over our heart. And so your own heart can be healed by encouraging other people. It's the way God's kingdom works. So this is what I'm going to do. I've got to tie my shoe. I stepped on my shoe string. And it's going to take me about 30 minutes to tie my shoe. I'm just kidding. Although, see what I did? Wait a minute. What I have found is it's harder to tie my shoes these days. So I got me a shoe with a zipper on it. <laughs> so while I tie my shoe... You got about 30 seconds to encourage somebody. Go. Y'all doing good. Real good. Come on, everybody, play along. Don't be a footy dude. All right. I want one person to tell me what was said to you. Go. Somebody tell me something was said to you. Awesome. So am I. You feel better? Do you feel better? I feel better. Very good. You feel better? How about you, Amy? You feel better? See how that works. Isn't that amazing? You mean God says something in the Word that actually works? How about that? Who would have thunk it? That God would say, lest, lest your heart becomes hard through the deceitfulness of sin. You see, what the Word is telling us is that we're all going to make mistakes and we're going to we're, we're not going to always be completely everything He wants us to be. That There's going to be difficult times and we're not always going to respond the right way. We're not making an excuse for it. That's just it. That's just why we're here. That's the way it goes. We're striving to do our best, but we don't always. And sometimes through the deceitfulness of the mistakes that we made, we can get in a rut where we feel like giving up and we look at everybody else and they seem to have it all together. And we get this wrong opinion about who God thinks we are. And we need somebody to come along and say, hey, 
I'm proud of you. You're doing good. And if the devil's put a shield around you, and you haven't heard that in a while, then tell somebody else. Tell somebody else how awesome they are. And turn that thing on its head and watch the devil have to leave. He don't stick around while encouragement's going on. He doesn't like that. Is that all right? All right. Now, we've come to the challenging part here. We have come to share in Christ if. Look at verse 14. We become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. We have become partakers. What is a partaker? It is a sharer. It is a partner. Philippians 1 and 7 says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Colossians 1 and 12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. In the light. So the scripture says we have come to share in Christ, and then we have the if. How many would love to just white out the ifs if we could? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So what does that mean? Well, first let's look at what it doesn't mean. This is not what it means because it doesn't say this. This is not what it means. It doesn't mean. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, then we will become partakers of Christ. It doesn't mean that because that's not what it said. Was it said in that order or are y'all paying attention? It wasn't said that way, was it? And it doesn't, it says we have become, not we will become. There's a difference. It says we have become. The if comes after. We have become. So it's important that we leave it there so we can clearly see that what this would imply and what this does not imply. And so let's put a knot there and see if that helps us understand. Let's go back to um, uh, back a slide. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So if we were to put a not there, it would say, we have not become partakers of Christ if we do not hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Do you understand it that way? All right? Are you with me? I lost you. This is not, all right, here's what it isn't saying. It's not saying if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, then we will become partakers of Christ. It doesn't say that. It says we have become. Say have become. have become. We have become partakers of Christ. We have become sharers of Christ. We share in Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. It simply says that believers in Christ who have become partakers of him will hold their confidence steadfast to the end. That's all it is saying. It is saying, I have trusted in him. I have believed in him. I've placed my faith in him. And I might fail my way forward, but I will fail my way forward to the end with my faith and confidence in him. And if for some reason, someone who says they are partakers of him, turn around and deny him, and say, I do not believe in Jesus, I will place my faith in Muhammad. I will place my faith in Buddha. I whatever, fill in the blanks. Then the writer of Hebrews is simply saying, they did not become partakers of Christ. Because those who have become partakers in Christ, it will be proven by, they will hold fast their confidence to the end. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. <laughs> no turning back. There may be a season of your life where you look like a prodigal. There may be a season of your life where you look like a wayward son. But there is faith in your heart and belief in your heart. And God is walking you through it. And it may take the pig pen for you to come to your senses to know that in your father's house, life is better. But you have chosen. You have believed. You have confidence in your heart. In Christ, where else can you go? John said in his epistle of 1 John chapter 2, he says this, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now, that's not talking about a specific church. We have plenty of people that leave this church, that go on to another church. That doesn't mean that they're no longer a part of God's kingdom. They follow God's will, God's desire. It may have been good intentions, bad intentions, whatever. That's between them and God. But God's children, God's sons and daughters, we hold our faith to the end. We have confidence in God through the good and the bad and the ugly of our lives. But we trust in Him all the way to the end. Can I get an amen? Amen. Please understand. And I know I'm going a little bit longer today, but hey, I was out last week, so... It's so important to note that the writer of Hebrews here is dealing with unbelief in this chapter. That's what he's dealing with. He references the Israelites who were uh, delivered from Egyptian bondage. They had a sea open up for them. They had manna rain down for them. They had water pour out of a rock for them. They had a cloud of fire lead them. But they got to the place where God said, you can enter in. And they said, we will not believe you. Matter of fact, many times they said, oh, then we could just go back to Egypt. They were not children of God. And they proved it through their unbelief. And so they died. The Bible says they died in the wilderness, having never received what God had for them if they would have believed in Him. Our text says to us in verse 19 that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The failures in their life is not what kept them out of the promised land. The failures in your life will not keep you out of the kingdom of God. It was unbelief. They didn't believe in God. They didn't trust in God. Even though they saw Him do all these mighty things, they didn't believe. Heaven and hell won't be divided by people who failed and people who didn't. It will be divided by people who believed in Christ and people who didn't believe in Christ. Heaven and hell won't be divided by people who went to church and people who didn't. People who gave lots of money and people just gave a little. People who went on mission trips and people who didn't know it will be divided by people who believe in Christ and people who do not believe in Christ. And what this chapter shows us is very clearly is that those who believe in Christ will believe in Him to the end. They might look like a prodigal, like I said. They might look like a wayward child. But they, from the beginning to the end, will come boldly to the throne of grace, find help when they need it. Because for those who have truly believed in Christ, there is nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to turn to. And that's what he's telling these Jewish believers who have left Judaism, they've left the law of Moses, they've left the sacrificial, the sacrifices of bulls and goats, they've left all that, and they've said in their hearts, they've professed with their mouth that we trust in Jesus. But now some of them are saying, I think we're going to go back. We're going to go back to Moses. My family has isolated me, and I'm being persecuted. I just want to go back to what was comfortable and and do it the old way. And the writer of Hebrews is very clear and very specific. If you leave Christ, if you reject Christ, and you go back to the shadow, then there remains no more sacrifice because you left 
the only sacrifice that works. So it brings us to this today. If you will hear his voice. Maybe just can somebody strum a guitar or something like that for me. Thank you. It might help me finish up. In verse 7, the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. See, the last I checked, it's still today. Is it? I don't have a watch, but I know it's today still. That means for us that are partakers of Christ, we can still choose to encourage each other. And we can believe God all the way home. And to those who have not believed, it is still today. So you can come to Christ. You can place your faith in Him because He has the power to save, heal, and deliver. I want us to stand. Maybe you're having a prodigal moment. <laughs> Maybe you're in a prodigal season of your life. Maybe you're that wayward child. Or maybe you've never, you've never truly believed. I mean, all in, all in. Not give God a chance, all in. Your faith is in Him. Maybe you've never done that. I think it's the only right thing for us to take a few moments right here. Maybe God, maybe God would lead you to encourage someone right now. Maybe God would lead you to pray for somebody. Whatever it might be. Can we just take a few moments and let the Lord do what He desires to do? Maybe this is a wake-up call for you that you've just, your, your heart is hard. And it's hard to the point where even unbelief is trying to filter in. Come on. May I encourage you today that God is good. His grace is enough. His work is finished. If you'll come to His throne, if you'll come in His presence, He will restore your soul. He will refresh you. He will renew a spirit in you. If you'll wait on Him, you'll walk, you'll run, you'll soar like an eagle. That's what He'll do for you. Come on, you're not defined by your failures. You're defined by who calls you friend, by the Lord who loves you. So stop being deceived. Stop getting caught up in that warped way of thinking. And let the words that I'm speaking right now encourage you. Encourage you. Just wait just a moment. You do whatever you feel like the Lord's leading you to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.